Hi everybody, um, welcome. My name is Josh Waihi. I'm a technical account manager at, at Acquia. Today I'm talking about uh, decoupled, why we're building a worse will. Uh, and this is, uh, I guess, built from my experience and what I've seen happening in the, uh, in the marketplace over the last couple of years. I'm kind of a, not really a front-end person, it's kind of almost comical to me that I'm speaking in a front-end track. Um, but uh, you know, I, I work a lot more in the sort of back-end or enterprise architecture space. So uh, even though we're talking in, in front-end, I'm not really talking front-end. There's no you know, snippet of code that you're going to see in this, this chat or, or anything like that. Um, uh, and yeah, I really focus on how to, you know, with, I work a lot with customers. We focus on how to do more with less risk, you know, often like a less code, that sort of thing. Um, yeah, so we're going to uh, kick on into it. Uh, and to really sort of set the stage, I thought we would sort of take a bit more of an approach on this around a, a history lesson. So I wanted to uh, talk about the, the evolution of Drupal. And, th and this sort of understand the origins of where we've come so we kind of understand the landscape that we're in today. So traditional Drupal, the static web, go back circa you know, 2006, and uh, we have a, a, a stack that this should be very much, you know, I'm not, not introducing any new concept to anybody here, right? Um, we've got the, uh, the, the LAMP stack, PHP running dynamic content out of uh, generating HTML, CSS and JavaScript being uh, re served up directly from the file system over something like Apache, and then pushed over to the browser, and we call that a page view, right? And this is a very standard thing, and this is what Drupal was built to do, do this exact uh, type of thing. Uh, and it worked really well in hobby uh, applications, and it worked just fine in, in mid-tier applications, and um, with a little bit of modification that worked reasonably okay in enterprise as well. Uh, and when we split this up on, in terms of responsibilities of what these different parts of the architecture do, you've got uh, the server side being the renderer, the, the, the dynamic work is done on the server side, and the browser is largely just static. It, doesn't, it tries to do as least amount of work as possible. The reason for that is because back in 2006 and in the 90s for that matter, uh, resources were bad and internet was slow and you know, all the power sat inside of server-side processing and so that's where we wanted to do all that work because we couldn't trust in the front end to have the resources to do the things that we wanted it to do uh, and it helped us you know, scale things a bit better and it's that kind of mainframe approach, right? Send the request to the mainframe, get it to do the job and send you back the result. Um, and from a, uh, if we look at the loading journey uh, standpoint, right, and I re recognize some of the text here can be really small to read. So um, this is trying to look at like the holistic end-to-end -end journey of trying to render out one of these page views, right? Um, so the far side, you've got things like stalling because the browser is not ready to do the request, doing a, D a DNS query lookup, making the connection, establishing the SSL, uh, sending the request now that you've got a connection, uh, waiting for that time to first byte, right, which is the big blue teal thing there, downloading the content, getting the first paint on, first meaningful paint, becoming visually ready, and then finally having a, a time to interactive. This is kind of the experience that we'd be producing in this, um, this area. There is a, some numbers down the bottom here, um, and right here is about 1.8 seconds to kind of give you a, an idea of, of how long that would take. Uh, and then we've got a pie graph to try and break down all of these parts and say where do they belong in the stack. So how much of this is attributable to network, how much is this, of this is attributable to browser, and how much of this is attributable to the back end. And the server, you can see here, is 75% of the problem. Uh, and that's that, that big time to first byte thing in the middle, right? And that's because Drupal has this mentality of, I need to render the entire page before I send the first byte of information. That's a big problem that Big Pipe actually went about solving in Drupal 8. Um, but you know, we, we basically have that mentality, and that's why it takes so long for anything to show up on the page. So we go about trying to optimize this a little bit more. We evolve a little bit uh, further on. 
and we move some of that static behavior over to the server side and we start creating caching. So we introduce things like Varnish or Squid or um, meme cache powered by Nginx or whatever uh, to kind of start producing static caching and rendering. And, and this falls on this premise of everybody that's coming to the website wants the same thing. So why do I have to do the same amount of thinking on the server side uh, twice when it's the same output each time? So if it's the same output each time, we can cache it, send it back, and it kind of removes that problem of Drupal needing to think through the whole problem before it sends the first byte back. It's already at this point static, and so we can start pushing things forward really quickly. And so it changes the loading journey significantly, right? Because the time you just fix it from going from, say, I needed 1.6 seconds to render a Drupal 7 page uh, to now just pulling it straight from cache. It's a 30 millisecond job, and everything now you know, can return in under a second, in under 600 milliseconds in that scale there. And it shifts the, the pie chart a lot. So now the, 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 where the, the uh, pain point is, is it, comes to, to become, starts becoming the browser. The server side gets really f uh, fast. So we've kind of, you know, networking's not a problem. Server side's, well, networking and server are half, half of the total equation, but it uh, starts to sort of put more of the performance issues on the browser. So let's look at how that uh, kind of works in a little bit more detail. Um, it, this, the, 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 the pie graphs and the, and the, ch and the bar graphs are uh, good sort of high level things, but you know, not all pages are the same. Um, caching works dependent on a number of things. One of them is um, how long can you cache something for uh, until you consider that piece of content stale and then you have to go and refresh it, right? Um, that's the expiry cache strategy. Uh, and so that really depends on you know, the, the, how, much, how much value you get out of that piece of uh, cached information. Uh, it depends on how frequently it gets used. And so there'll be parts of your site that get used a lot. So you know, it's usually maybe the, the top 20% of your content gets used a lot. Uh, and then there's parts of your site, maybe the bottom 50, that doesn't get used a whole lot. I've got an example here of a site that has, say, 500 pages. It has an average response time from Drupal of 1.8 seconds. And then let's say there are 10,000 uh, page views that occur in, in you know, X time frame. Doesn't, the, the time doesn't really make sense here because we're not sort of talking about TTLs. But you've got page distribution of 20%, 30%, 35 and 15, and in brackets there you've got the numbers. Uh, and then you've got the amount of traffic that would hit those distributions of, of page contents. And then you've got the cache hit rate calculated for each one of them. So for the top 20% of your content, you might get a 98.57% cache hit rate. For the bottom, you get a 75%. And you average that out, it will come into 85.27%. Maybe you can check my math if you like. Um, so 14.73% of the traffic is greater than 1.8 seconds because 14. 73% uh, of the traffic had to incur that Drupal page load that had that time to first byte. If we increase the page views, uh, sorry, if we drop the page views down from um, 10,000 page views to just 5,000 page views, then what happens, the same algorithm, play the whole thing out, but now 27% of the uh, total page views have to incur that Drupal uh, page load time. So there's actually uh, worse performance because you've got uh, less amount of traffic going to your site. Uh, and so in the caching strategy that we end up implementing is more page views, more performance. You, you, you just need to have, it works really well, it scales really well for big enterprise sites, you know, news, media, global sporting events, that sort of thing. But if you don't have a lot of traffic to your site, um, it, it's less effective. Um, and then the, the, so the way that we kind of want to get around that is by having long, longer cache lifetimes. Longer cache lifetimes mean you've got a higher uh, chance of, of getting a cache hit and the, the site remaining more performant for longer. And so the sort of final evolution that you know, took Drupal essentially 10 years to reach this point was implementing cache invalidation. And this is the, you know, it, it was kind of there in Drupal 7. The purge module existed, but it was not very holistic. Uh, it was not very accurate. There was a lot of things, a lot of reasons why you still really couldn't have a very long cache lifetime. Uh, and that got fixed in Drupal 8 with the introduction of cache tags 
And so now Drupal is able to produce a, site, a, a page, send that into cache, and it could be cached for a week, a month, a year. And if nothing changes on that page, Drupal knows about if something's going to change on that page. And so it's able to cage, uh, it's actually able to actively purge that piece of content um, in, you know, whenever that content's actually due to be updated because a, a content event occurred inside the CMS. So now there's like this just direct parity and we can be as performant for as long as we possibly need to until Drupal needs to spend that time to regenerate that page. And so it is sort of like the, a, a really fine-tuned, mature strategy for, for delivering uh, uh, content. Um, but in the time, the 10 years it took Drupal to get to this point, uh, there's been a lot of paradigm shifts. So we've kind of moved from data, uh, so into like a data refresh kind of view of the web now. It's no longer about page refresh. We want to start to personalize our experience uh, for our, in, our users a lot more, which means that the um, that sort of idea of one cached item that could be served to everybody uh, becomes more questionable. There's actually more nuance in the data that we serve up people on based on their context. Um, there is also a lot of event-driven data now being pushed into uh, people, uh, to people rather than them having to request it. Um, and, you know, th these sorts of things, uh, JavaScript becomes quite naturally suited to, to uh, the, these sort of demands. The, this has also become an emerging technology to help uh, address and solve all of these things. Um, so yep, you, have, you have things like pageless DOM manipulation, so now we can change the environment that the person sees, the page that they see, without us having to, for them to go back to the server, although they, they kind of are, they just don't know about it. Um, yeah, we can do client-side personalization, so we can leverage their processing power. Um, and yeah, event-driven is, is handled with things like web sockets and being able to uh, maintain a connection open to the, the back end and, and receive new information. So um, how does you know, Drupal kind of stack up against this? There's a lot of pros and cons. So pros, it's, uh, it's really good at content management. We've got the optimized content delivery down. Uh, it does centralized processing, which is good because we don't have to um, let, you know, it's not distributed, we don't have to send the processing power over to the client to do something. And it can scale simple content really well. We've nailed that. Uh, the con of it in today is that it's monolithic. I'm going to go into that a little bit more uh, later on. Um, it has complexity that's ingrained into it when we start talking about personalization. Um, and it has very limited front-end leverage, what it can really control on the front-end. Um, and that, that slow time to first byte still persists, even though it's sort of being, uh, in a probability sense, just dramatically reduced. Um, and so localized processing is, is sort of the next frontier that we're now in, in the midst of, of pursuing. Uh, and this is where we want to start changing up that model of everything's dynamic on the server side and everything is static on the client side. We start to play around with this a little bit more and we start to introduce dynamic UX experience into the, and we're going to say what, to do that we're going to be able to leverage the processing power in people's client side devices. Uh, and of course, since the inception of Drupal, things have changed. You know, bandwidth's gotten better. I mean, you guys still have the NBN, but the you know, bandwidth's got better for the rest of the world. Um, there's, uh, there's also, you know, phone processing power is a lot better, right? And so there's a good reason to say that we can start to, to distribute where that dynamic processing power takes place. Um, but it also means that the loading journey starts to change as well, because while we have now an optimized uh, content delivery from the server side, um, we start to see these client side complexity increases these things like time to interactive, visually ready, first meaningful paint, and first paint starts to take up the time for someone to, to engage. Um, so yeah, client side processing is, is okay, right? Like power, phones these days are, are pretty powerful and so they can do uh, lots of stuff, you know, um, and you know, they've got eight cores inside them and eight gigs of RAM and um, you know, the, the, the pixel resolution is better than they've ever been, all these sorts of things. Um, and so you know, there's, because of that, it's a good reason why we can start putting their, our code onto people's devices and getting them to compute, right? 
Uh, and that certainly seems to be the case if we start looking at this from an uh, economical standpoint. Uh, so for the last you know, five years, um, JavaScript, and this is, uh, this is the Octoverse, this is GitHub looking at popularity of languages on GitHub, um, that JavaScript has been the most popular language uh, for quite some time, and PHP's fallen, it's dropped uh, below uh, Python now. Uh, in the job market, here you can see um, Laravel st still had, at this point in time, I think this was 2018, uh, still had more demand for, for jobs than, than React and Node, but React and Node is directly below them, and PHP is all the way at, at number 14. So there is a, in, the, in the market there is a demand from, uh, from people who want to hire uh, more React and Node.js developers, and this influences the availability of all kinds of um, things in the resourcing market as well. Uh, this is GitHub emojis, again a part of the Octoverse that looks at how people use emojis in GitHub to understand sentiment around language. So at the top there you've got the hearts and you can see that um, PHP is 6.9% uh, of, the, of, the, of the emojis, of the heart emoji is inside the PHP language, while JavaScript is uh, at, at 6.5. So people in the PHP community heart 0.4% more of the time than, <laughs> than JavaScript. They love it just 0.4% more um, at the moment. Uh, but however, the thumbs up me in, in uh, emoji, you can see JavaScript there is at 84.2%, while PHP is at 80.3%. So um, yeah, maybe PHP lovers love PHP ever so slightly more. Uh, but there's more optimism in JavaScript. <laughs> um, PHP is party more by 0.3% than, than uh, JavaScript people. Uh, and then PHP uh, in pessimism, the down, downward thumbs up, is at 2.4% while JavaScript is at 1.1%. Still better than C Sharp, right? <laughs> Still better than C Sharp. But, um, but you, know, you can see that there is a, a swinging mood there, right? There's, there's a lot of optimism inside of the, the Node.js uh, community, and then there is a bit more um, sort of uh, success that's happening with PHP, but this speaks to their maturity in their, I think, in, in, in their language and where they're at. I'll, I'll speak about that a little bit more. Um, now, with being able to bring things into the dynamic side of the client side, people start developing things and they want more com common and consistent ways of being able to develop things. And so, that so comes and emerges front end uh, frameworks. So these are things, you know, if, if you're a front-end developer, you'll know pretty much every one of those logos. Um, and you know, these people want to you know, have their own technology, their own discipline, their own methodology to, to deploy into. And um, they don't want to be hindered by the same delivery processes that Drupal uh, is, is delivered by. And so they need a new delivery pipeline to be a part of the project. Uh, and that ultimately means that we end up with two backends. So here we've now taken the pre-existing dynamic stack that we, we knew about, and we're going to tack onto there a file system and a web server that's designed to just to serve up uh, client-side apps um, and pump that through the, the CDN uh, and then out to um, the client-side inside the JavaScript engine that we compile it into. And this is all so that we can have you know, a React app deployment pipeline that's deployed by CI and then a Drupal one that's different. You've got two different teams that deliver both of these projects and they want to do it in a polylithic way, not in a monolithic way. Right, so this is a, if you decide to say, no, we're going to roll the JavaScript, the, the JavaScript app into Drupal, then it means that you need to wait for the Drupal team that are ready to do a deployment before you can actually release your code and that team gets really frustrated about that. So they separate it out and then now they're, they're um, running two different server-side stacks to be able to deliver a single application. And that's becoming pretty much the, the norm, like um, having a multiple uh, technologies hosted on the server-side and being comp compiled in. And so we're, we're starting to see you know, polylithic service delivery becoming uh, very, very, very common. Um, uh, but of course, meanwhile, what's happening in the loading journey is things in the client side are getting bigger and fatter. And this scale has gone from 1.8 seconds to this is now 4 seconds. 
Um, and that's because all these frameworks have to get loaded in, they have to get compiled, they have to get built, run, rendered, uh, and, and there's, they're doing a lot more things. And when frameworks uh, start to emerge, especially in the front end, they want to do more things, they want to have more control of more things. Uh, and so they need to have time to think and to be more logical about things, which sounds kind of familiar, right? Remember, Drupal had to do all of its thinking until it produced its first, its, its first bite. And the same thing is now happening, it's just happening on the front end instead of the back end. Um, so time to reactive is a real problem. Um, does you know, everybody know who Eddie Osmani is? Well, raise your hand if you know who Eddie Osmani is, one person. Uh, Eddie Osmani is the um, lead developer for Chrome, Google Chrome browser. And he's got a really great talk. He's done it twice now on the state of JavaScript. And these are just slides that I've, I've uh, repurposed uh, for, for him. Uh, and this is uh, him looking at the time to interactive between a, a, um, uh, two different websites um, that he's blurred out, but I think you can make out what that is. Um, and showing that these two sites actually take a very, very long time to load. And the time to interactive, the point where they're actually kind of useful, is taking a very, very long time to get there. And that's all basically because these things are fully decoupled apps that take um, all this time to, to load in and create an experience. Um, this is the cost of JavaScript. Um, I imagine my slides will be available somewhere if you guys want to check it out, look for that. It's, he, he's got a Medium blog uh, and writes all of this out in a great blog. He's got maybe like 60 slide presentation of just, and he's got a YouTube video I think as well and it's well worth the read to understand JavaScript uh, and the cost of it in, in today. But I'll give you a couple more slides from here. Um, this is J, uh, JavaScript processing for CNN.com being profiled against different devices. So at the top there, you can see the iPhone 8 on the A11 processor. Uh, and then he's got highlighted in blue the Alcatel 1X, which is a, a, under $100 as a phone. So on the iPhone 8, it takes 1.1 seconds to, to load CNN.com, while on the Alcatel 1X, it takes 32 seconds. And then you've got something that's kind of in the middle of the road, the Moto G4, which is on the Snapdragon and that takes about 10 seconds to load. So you can see here that this is um, actually uh, client-side processing, something that we knew about it in right in, back in the, in the 90s is that it's not the same experience for everybody. And one of the, the points that Eddie Osmani really uh, calls out in his talks is that often developers, uh, people who are you know, fortunate enough to have high-end devices, uh, and so when they're doing their testing and they're getting the user experience, they're usually getting the very best experience that they can get, um, and everything else is degraded from there. Um, and so you're remembering that um, this is just looking at device performance that isn't even factoring into it um, network availability. So 3G, 4G experiences can be very different for people as well, and when you need to load in assets, it can be a real a big problem. Uh, he did some, uh, being the, the lead of um, Google Chrome, he did a bunch of analysis and was able to uh, calculate that the, the median web page today has 350 kilobytes of JavaScript in it. And it takes an, uh, an average of 15 seconds until it's interactive. I mean, at the beginning of my talk, I was talking about how it took us a long time to get a page out from the server side and it took 1.8 seconds. And now we're tolerating 15 second page loads with front end delivery. So um, he goes on to point out that mobile is really a spectrum that you have to think about. And maybe when you're delivering your apps, it's a good idea to think about which phones you want to target performance metrics around. And when you've got performance metrics that you need to hit, you know, make sure that you're doing some testing on those. And it's going to be different for different customers and different clients. Certain types of businesses are going to appeal to people with different you know, sort of average phone specs or different network availabilities. Uh, equally, when we think about this from a network standpoint, it's really important to remember that JavaScript is not, from a, from a size standpoint, it's not the same as other assets. So a 200 kilobyte image is not the same as a 200 kilobyte piece of JavaScript because when that image gets to the browser, it just loads up, it's a, it's a uh, bitmap ref render, right? it can just be rendered straight away. But when 200 kilobytes of JavaScript hits the browser, it needs to get compiled and it gets turned into two megabytes of code. And then it needs to get run 
and then it needs time to execute and render and use the main thread and all these other things. So it takes a lot longer to deal with JavaScript. Uh, and so they, um, the size of, of the, of the uh, JavaScript you're using, he sort of uses as an indicator of how long these things will take, but being very, very mindful about it. And he actually goes even further around saying you should have uh, budgets, JavaScript size budgets that you work towards in your projects, and you won't go over certain budgets, and that also forces you to make sure that everything is performant and optimal. Oh, how did they get in there? Um, so this, uh, this reinventing server-side um, ends up, like, how, do, how, do, how do we kind of deal with this today? How do we make the, the world faster and not be 15 seconds on average and, and really slow for other people? Well, the Node guys have a really great idea. Um, they want to take Node and put it on the server side and then be able to um, create some static renders of the pages so that they're ready to go um, from the server side and then uh, get over to the, to the client side. And they do that with things like Gatsby. Uh, and so they'll end up you know, pulling the content from, uh, say, Drupal headlessly, pull it into Gatsby, and then they will uh, create a static render. And then that can load up directly into the client side. And then it's like, bam, they're ready to go. And then all their frameworks don't have to do all this sort of pre-rendering work. And so that time to first paint and, and things kind of get a bit faster. Um, and you know, you've, now we've just like fixed the problem, right? Like we've got the, the beast mode on and fi figuring out how to make all of this really kind of work. Um, and you know, you, you end up getting a loading journey that looks like this now. So we're using, you know, back to the 1.8 second scale. Um, browser still, you know, this, this diagram now starts to look a bit familiar, right? We like, from a loading standpoint, we've kind of gone back to doing exactly what uh, what we were doing uh, with Drupal and Drupal, uh, what Drupal 8 had just achieved, right? We've started to reinvent the wheel. So uh, looking at the, the pros and cons of this, like we've got, it's the same pros and cons that we had with traditional Drupal, right? We, we've got content management, optimized content delivery now, uh, centralized processing, because it's all being processed on the server side by this Gatsby program. Uh, it's scaling simple content really well. Um, the cons, it's, poly, it's polylithic. So it used to be monolithic, now it's that it's polylithic. Like the, the complexity of what we're doing to reach the exact same goal, the exact same endpoint, is by just increasing the complexity and reinventing the wheel and doing everything the same again. Um, it's really, uh, there's a lot more complexity there, and that it got exponential, right? It went from having one uh, technology stack to, to maintain to having two technology stacks to maintain. And quite often, Node has a tendency to want to have multiple stacks for different purposes to do slightly different things. And so you, it can get really exponential really quick. Uh, they haven't solved cache and validation yet. So now they've actually gone backwards, not forwards. They've now had to deal with expiry again. And Gatsby has a tendency to want to re-render your entire site when you need to update the cache. And so it can be really slow for sites to have lots of content. Um, and so, you know, how, yeah, what about the, the, slow, the size of the first time to bite? Well, that kind of uh, shifts it a little bit. But yeah, we've kind of started to reinvent the wheel. And, uh, you know, <laughs> this is kind of like a picture, I th maybe a little unfair, about like where I think the, what they're kind of trying to do right, right now. Um, but it's not, it's not worth noting that like, I'm not trying to hate on Node that much, but it, 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 I'm trying to kind of um, say that, you know, they're both, they're both wheels, but PHP is like this because it's had the time to mature. And Node has not had that same time and exposure. So it's not to say that Node won't solve these same problems, but saying that right now, this is kind of what, what they look like. Uh, and so um, let's have a look at technology maturity. And everyone hopefully has seen like a um, adoption bell, uh, bell curve diagram. So at the very beginning, you have early adopters of a technology. Then the second sector is of the early majority of people who adopt something. Then you hit a peak. The late majority then join in. And then you have these laggers at the end. And then eventually the, the, the technology end of life itself uh, out, right? Um, along with that is, uh, oh, one slide too soon. Um, you have kind of like where developers sort of flow with, with this as well. Uh, and so you've got. And, and the technology itself. So um, you, know, you, you produce the POCs, it becomes usable, the early adopters join in, the early majority join and they start building the frameworks. Uh, I mean, you know, I can think about, I've been with the Drupal community since 2007, 
Um, and you know, it was really exciting trying to solve all these problems in the Drupal community in Drupal 6 and in Drupal 7 and being a part of a community, that community spirit really like thrived to try and you know, build up everything. And I think we see that now in the Node community today as well. Um, and then we kind of hit like a feature complete point, right? Nothing's ever really complete, but like it's complete enough to win the day. And like Drupal's done that now with enterprise delivery, right? When you get to that level, you can say you answer most of the world's problems with what you're trying to do. Uh, so once you hit that place, then you stabilize. So we've become a pretty stable project now. Uh, then the problems become solved and then they become boring and developers leave because there's, there's nothing interesting uh, to do anymore. And so for, uh, if you look at this from like a customer's perspective, or you look at it from the perspective of a, uh, an agency who makes business from doing project deliveries, this space here is the prime time. Because it's the time where it takes you the least amount of effort to get all of the features and requirements met for the customer. It's also the time where things are stabilized. So from a customer standpoint, there's the least amount of risk involved in taking on a project of that size. That's why you see late majority often being the enterprise people. They're the late last to the game because they, they've got the most to lose and so they want the least amount of risk inside that project. Uh, and this, uh, so if we um, look at that and then kind of map out like where are these technologies in this scale? Like, take a guess, where is Node? Where is PHP? And I thought I'd throw in another one for, you know, for scale. Where's, where's Java in this? Uh, and I kind of think that they are somewhere like this. I think Drupal's in that prime time spot right now. I think Java's just popped out, um, and I think Node's still building towards uh, a feature complete place. Um, but it's got a lot of it's got a lot of the excitement, a lot of the early majority behind it, and trying to make things you know really work with it. Um, and this kind of I think when you think about this maturity in the technology, it kind of explains a lot about what of what's happening. Um, and it starts to make us, we should hopefully make you think more about um, what's the right technology to use and when, when to use it. Uh, and when I started thinking about, you know, when to use technology and when not to use it, um, evidently Kenny Rogers came to mind. Um, so I wrote a, a quick song um, that kind of goes like this. You got to know when to, to decouple, know when, when, to, when to couple. Uh, know when to do front-end dynamic and when not. You've got to count your node modules when you're sitting at the PR merge. Uh, there'll be time enough for rendering when the compiling's done. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so, <laughs> uh, so here's some tips for decoupling and, and being able to make those decisions better in your projects. I kind of didn't really highlight, but it is worth mentioning that there is so many good reasons to use decoupled components. There's so many legitimate reasons. And let's like, be really like honest about it. Like Drupal and PHP is not a good choice for a lot of different sort of tasks that we want to be doing in today's web. So there is a lot of good reasons to use it. It's just finding out the right reasons and implementing them in sensible ways. So um, yeah, performance is worse in a fully decoupled architecture. I think there might be people in this room that have learned that the hard way. But um, Really seriously think about if it's worth that performance hit. I use that now as just a rule of thumb, and I've got some examples I can share with you around that. Um, start coupled and validate reasons to decouple. So my position when I work with customers is that we're doing a coupled build. And whenever I, I encounter a, um, yeah, a trigger-happy Node.js developer who says, I've been you know, really, really wanting to use this fully decoupled thing or whatever, um, I question them about that and what they want to do um, and help them try and you know, talk them off the ledge and back into doing something more sensible with server-side rendering and then just let's just you know, try and find bits that make sense to, to increase. Uh, if it's going to be static and you're only ever going to render it once, don't do it decoupled. Um, you know, polylithic delivery increases operational expenses exponentially and also makes the delivery pipeline a lot more complicated as well. So simplifying everything by being very um, sort of subjective or about how you use that. Uh, clarifying editorial requirements up front. Um, so uh, I was on a project where they had a Node.js team and, and solutions architect come in and they decided they were going to go fully decoupled. They went into eight months delivery in the head of UX one day said, um, 
you need to you need to let us be able to control layout from from the UI. Completely killed their project and brought Drupal back into the picture. So they really had to redesign everything. A bunch of the Node.js team left because they could not solve a problem that Node.js today still cannot solve. Um, do not use DIY APIs. Um, I've <laughs> come across multiple scenarios where people are trying to like, you know, optimize the type of content that is produced out of Drupal for the app and they make it bespoke. Um, but you evidently you know, write problems like, you know, if you write a custom API into Drupal, there's a good chance you're going to get the cache tags wrong. And then you can't do invalidation, and then you're back to an expiry, and you have stale content, and that is systemic into your front end app. It becomes a big problem. So just use JSON API or GraphQL where they've already solved that problem. Uh, I want to talk about a couple of examples that have worked well, and, and, and uh, well, one example that's worked well, maybe a couple that haven't. So uh, this is the ozopen.com. Uh, we've run, uh, for the last two years, uh, Aqua has run the Australian Open on Drupal 8 with, uh, with the help of some partners. Uh, this is the architecture that it looks like. So we've got um, an AWS data center. We've got Aqua Cloud sitting there hosting the Drupal site. They've got an um, on-premise editorial team who interact with Aquia Cloud and Brightcove to produce content and video. Um, they've got a um, scoring solution, which is like a bunch of lambdas, essentially, and, and uh, red, um, caching layers that pull real-time sporting data that comes straight off the courts and into that solution. They, uh, that's called SMT, by the way. It's what the solution that provides all those data points. Um, it comes through thick and fast because like, day one you have like 30 concurrent games of tennis being played and each, uh, the end of each match is a point and that point is then propagated out through into the, the scoring solution. So the volume of updates is phenomenal. Um, that gets pushed out to Ably. The client uh, requests uh, a page from Aquia Cloud. It's cached at Aquia Cloud. It gets cached at the edge globally. Uh, and then when the page loads, it establishes a WebSocket connection to Ably, and then Ably pushes scoring data in real time into the visitor. So when you're um, in front of uh, the site, oh man, this thing jumped so quick. Oh, there, that's well, okay. Um, you get this sort of thing, so you've got this component here, uh, which is playing a game, the tennis ball showing you who's serving, there's the points over here, and the, um, the, uh, the, the points for the set. And that's all being delivered over that from that WebSocket data, and it's a fully uh, run by a JavaScript front end uh, part of the application. Drupal doesn't really have anything to do with that card. But then the big screenshot over here you can see of the page, well, this is those cards you can see are running at the top. So there's a number of games, and there's all of these different games in progress that's all being basically a decoupled delivery. And then below that is, above it and below it, above it is the header of the website, and below it is the news, a piece of news, so they've like integrated you know, real-time sporting data with a content experience, and all of that is Drupal, just coupled and delivered through tweak templating and content types and just the, you know, the news editorial experience. And this is a really good use case of uh, building a, a de progressively decoupled app. Uh, so we had some really amazing wins with this strategy, one being we got 99.9% .9 cache hit rate. As a back-end guy, that's like you know, the holy grail of caching, 100% um, uptime. And that is significant considering that this is a global sporting event. Like We have some of the highest loads of traffic that you get on that type of thing, and we, we stand up with it just really, really well because of that caching strategy. Most of the traffic is just handed off at the, at the edge. And that was a really smart architectural decision to go down that way and not have to lean on uh, you know, a lot of decoupled things to do things that Drupal does really well out of the box. Uh, a couple of other examples. Um, we worked with uh, SGX. Um, they're a stock exchange. And so they are, you know, um, as you can imagine, a stock exchange, they have a lot of stock data that comes through and there's a lot of you know, graphs to update in real time as those sort of things happen. And that was a big reason why they decided to go with a fully decoupled solution. Uh, and so they went through the couple, they um, also had these like really sharp JavaScript guys and they decided that all their frameworks like React and Vue and, and all that, they weren't good enough for them. So they had to, like they decided to rebuild one by themselves. Um, they decided to use GraphQL um, out of Drupal 8, uh, built on Drupal uh, Lightning. Um, they had uh, it delivering to multiple users and they had, uh, at the time that I produced a slide, they were in the beta, they're actually live now. 
but they built an entire fully decoupled site and they ran into a lot of challenges around like, you know, just general content delivery, like the menu system and um, the headers and the footers and the templating and all that sort of stuff. And uh, this is all stuff that they wouldn't have had to have dealt with if they had just kept the coupling to the pieces of the graph. So like, this was a, uh, you know, systemically, a, a, um, they had challenges with delivery because they were, you know, led by people who wanted to do everything in a very decoupled nature. I kind of like say this a lot, a lot is like it, when you're a hammer, everything looks like a nail. If you're a Node.js developer, you want to solve every problem with Node. Uh, and that can be sometimes a, a really difficult uh, thing to navigate if you don't know better ways of doing things faster. Um, this was their architecture. And so they had um, Drupal, they would use uh, Drupal as a, a way for the editors to manage the content. And then they had um, you know, fully decoupled stacks, so basically the front end user would never see Drupal per se, they would just serve up headless content as you expect in a headless uh, site. Um, but they, I think they're now working on the Gatsby uh, thing, right? Like they wanna, um, they wanna like do that. So that's gonna be another uh, fun thing for them. Um, oh, wait, that's, last one was Malco. Uh, they're a, uh, essentially a casino in, in Macau. Um, and they, uh, yeah, similarly, the agency there decided that they wanted to do a fully decoupled headless build. Um, they put a, an API gateway in front of Drupal that was back-ended by lambdas. Those lambdas then did something magical, I couldn't tell you what, before they went and did a back-end headless request to Drupal. And then what, in doing so, they completely removed all of Drupal's caching strategy from the front end. And so they would end up with performance issues and Drupal would be absolutely happy and then the API gateway would be in, in trouble and then like they were doing multilingual translations and um, you know, you'd switch translation the next minute a page of 404 and that was nothing to do with, with Drupal because we weren't handling the page renders and all this sort of stuff. So like it, it took a long time to sort of get cohesion on something that again is just stock standard. And the worst part about their decision to go fully decoupled is that it's a static site. There's literally nothing that they needed to do, like a pageless refresh or um, any kind of real-time data coming into it. It was just purely that that's what the resources the agency had, and so that's how they were going to go about delivering the site. And it you know, led to, to buggy, buggy behavior. So I'm going to um, kind of wrap it up there, uh, leave it. If you guys, um, I know I kind of took pretty much almost all the time, if there's some questions, we've got some time for some questions that were really cool. Um, tonight we've got um, a, an event happening at seven o'clock down at the Glass House, so if you guys like to come along, it'd be great to see you, have a, a bit more chat. Um, that's the uh, Aquia event, but thank you very much for, my, uh, for listening to my talk, and maybe there's some people who have some thoughts or questions on my uh, observations. Kurt. <laughs> yeah. uh, we're actually running Vue.js, uh, rendering on the server side, so we're running headless Drupal at the moment. Uh, we do have some of the issues you're talking about, uh, but in terms of caching validation, we're actually um, using uh, the purge cache tags out of Drupal, um, grabbing those on the front end and sending those as headers on the front end. Uh, and then basically using the purger module to purge front and back end caches. So you can actually do caching validation on headless just using tools straight out of Drupal. Yeah, that's right, you can. Um, and Gra JSON API, GraphQL both support cache tags, right? So if you've got validation, you can do that. The problem is when that works fine as long as you're only ever rendering on the front end. The moment that you try and do something like a Gatsby, where you bring the, the rendering to the server side from on a, on a node stack, then you start then you start serving static content from the server side to the browser with no cache tag data, and so you can no longer invalidate uh, when or even invalidate Gatsby when a new content event happens. So I don't know about Gatsby, uh, but the way that we're doing that with Nuxt, um, we are actually invalidating the cache on the server side. Uh, as well as client side, um, and uh, we're, we are essentially doing that by servicing. Service so, you, what are you using to do your server side renders? Uh, Nuxt. So Nuxt. it's the Vue.js equivalent of Next, which is from React. Uh, okay. It's quite a different concept to Gatsby, which I think is actually just rendering static HTML rather than, and yeah. then it's kind of serving that HTML. Whereas um, 
Nuxt and Next do the same rendering server side and client side, but it's just on the very first request for a full page, it delivers HTML. So it's, it's a very different concept to Gatsby. But when it serves that HTML, oh, so wait, so are you, when you, is it statically stored on the server side or is it still dynamically rendered no, on no, the server side? No, it's still dynamically rendered. Right. And gotcha. then we're storing that essentially in Varnish, um, which we've got running as a CDN. I won't go into all of that, but yeah. So like a, a Varnish hit would you know, usually yield like I say a 30 millisecond return. What does a nuts pay request on the server side return? Like what time, time frames are you waiting for? I couldn't tell you off the top of my head. At the moment, they're is a lot slower than I want them to be. So out of punish, things are looking really good. Uh, but then the initial uncached request is probably a lot slower than I want it to be now. Uh, but we've got a list of things that we're gonna do to improve that. But the good thing is we can cache a lot on the front end and purge on node safe, essentially with, with the purge module. So our, um, our cache sheets are gonna be huge soon. Cool. Yeah. All right, thank you very much.